thank you, Schengen, for the highlights. Um, it, is, it is an opportunity to, to change things, um, this urbanization. Thank you very much for that. Uh, my next speaker is Louise Fresco. She is the president of uh, Wageningen University and Research Center in the Netherlands. She's also an author of several books, um, and most recent one is called Hamburgers in Paradise, and it gives you a fascinating history of the food that we eat. And it's also about food abundance. Uh, please join me in welcoming her. Schengen, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. What a wonderful report. Compliments to everybody who has been working on it. I think it comes indeed with a message of hope. But I wouldn't be the critical scientist that I'm known for to also mention a couple of the challenges we have. I think the hope lies in the fact that the number of people indeed that suffer from hunger and malnutrition is declining, agricultural production is going up. But we have still a very long way to go. Yields in Africa are far lower than they are in Asia for some of the critical cereals, and they're still far lower of what they could be also in, a in Asia or in Latin America from what they could be from a biological perspective. The reasons we know. But it's still important to understand because to me the hope lies in the fact that we have this enormous potential. On the, at the same time, if you look at the food and nutrition situation, yes, the number has declined. But if I put it in different terms, we have about 2 billion people who still suffer from malnutrition due to micronutrients, iron, etc. We also have 1.8 billion who have a problem because they are either overweight or even obese. And you know, obesity is also a form of malnutrition. If I put those together, we have 3.45 billion people out of the 7 plus billion that we have who still have a problem with food in one way or the other. So half of the world population today, with all the abundance we have, still has an issue with food. And many of those, of course, live in, live in cities. Um, I think the report and the issue of urbanization point very much to the fact that we cannot look at production or consumption in isolation. It is about the food chain. And you're so right. There is, to my knowledge, not one country that has an integrated food chain policy. And if there's one recommendation to derive from this report is that we do need that integrated approach, which in fact brings together a lot of ministries because it also means uh, rural areas, but water uh, pricing and so on. So there is a lot to be done. And interestingly enough, a lot of that in the next decade or so, could be very much helped by the increasing digitalization that we see. We now talk in Wageningen about the internet of food. And we expect quite soon, also in countries where you perhaps wouldn't think the technology is up to that level, that a lot more food items and production modes and consumers will be linked. And the Internet of Food is a fantastic way, not just to get transparency on price, for example, for small farmers, but also to get information on food safety. We have a tiny little chip in Wageningen that's now included in all kinds of food packages from the start that, for example, meat comes out of the slaughterhouse. It actually describes not just the origin and hence allay some of the fears of consumers of where does my food come from, but it also traces, for example, the temperature regime during transportation all the way down to a uh, refrigeration station or the supermarkets. So food safety can actually be helped very much. There's, there's another dimension, of course, to the digitalization, apart from the usual drones and so on that you can think of, we can now actually measure uh, by the way, the soil water status or the nutrient status of leaves of fields to the one centimeter, one square centimeter, which means that the monitoring of things like fertilizer and water can be far more precise with all the negative effects of emissions that can be man managed in a much better way. You may say this is only right for California and a couple of other places. Um, that's not true. I think here we will see the same quantum jump 
countries that maybe haven't gone through all the tractors uh, as we see them now will jump directly to drone technology quite quickly. It raises an issue on data management and so on. But I think that kind of internet of things applied to food and agriculture will be with us very soon. However, it also means, of course, that some of the manual labor will go out of production. And the, the most pressing issue, I think, in the rural areas is how can we find employment or differently put value added in the food chain for those who will be leaving agriculture. And it's logical that people will leave agriculture. It happens all over the world because agriculture work is very hard to do. It's not attractive. Cities are more attractive, but we need to find ways to get that employment right. And that is, I think, a, um, a very important issue because it raises the issue of how can we get value, value added in the food chain, which means how can the food chain in rural areas be competitive with imported food, which raises the issue of how countries will actually deal with things like their food policy and food and agriculture subsidies. And, and this is a very, very delicate political point because it raises the issue of protectionism or not for how long and where and how can it be done with the WTO. I won't get into that too much right now, but I think it's maybe something for the discussion. Um, the other thing that is important in cities, of course, is that we run the risk of a serious dichotomy between the, rural, the urban poor and the urban rich. The middle classes, what we call the middle classes, are in fact in many cities the urban rich. I mean, I'm not talking about that 1% very, very rich. The middle classes are more and more removed from the actual process of production. And what we see is an issue of perception. There is a sense for many people that our food is actually dangerous, that our food is um, artificial, that imported food is more dangerous, and that what happened in the past with all that manual work in rural areas was somehow better. Now, anybody who knows the reality of trying to plant one hectare of rice by hand knows that, no, the past was not necessarily better. No, it wasn't necessarily safer to have an animal slaughtered around the corner. However, perception is a very strong thing, and it also permeates policy levels. So we have to be extremely careful that we don't throw away the child, the baby with the bathwater. We have to cater for middle classes who are worried about perception by showing, and again, the internet can help us there, the authenticity and quality of food. There will be, I think, a niche, a room for locally produced food, but it's very clear that the 10 billion plus cities of this world, and the, the Shanghai's, the Mexico cities, and, and Lagos cannot feed themselves just locally, not even locally in the country. Import and trade has driven down food prices, and it's a good thing, but it has some negative effects, and we need to be very aware of the negative effects, especially in terms of employment and farmer incomes. And if you ask me what keeps you awake at night, it is the question also, who will be the farmers of the future? We need to help the farmers of the future to become more professional, to be proud, and have all the modern technology at their fingertips. And that's the only way to keep farmers in business. There's another issue related to cities that we must think about, and that is the one you don't perhaps think about immediately. We all talk about food safety being an issue of concern. My concern is also what are going to be the proteins of the future? Because we see with increasing urbanization, people will consume more proteins, particularly animal proteins. Animal proteins are expensive, but they are there to stay. There are many good reasons why people eat meat and fish. And I'm certainly no advocate of going to an entirely vegetarian world, but we have to manage the animal proteins very well. Where do they, do they come from? What is the future of aquaculture and the efficiency of aquaculture versus, for example, pig and poultry? Where are the areas where we cannot have either and we have to have other sources of protein? What is the balance between vegetarian or vegetable protein and animal protein? We now know that you can, uh, for example, um, include one-third of vegetable protein in, in processed meat without the consumer noticing it in terms of the uh, mouth feel and in terms of the quality. Cities are often thought of as uh, pools of renewal. And I think our challenge today is to show how we can organize the food supply chain also in cities. 
and how much food perhaps can be produced in cities. I'm not um, optimistic in that latter part. I think most of the food will not be produced in cities or even close to cities for the simple reason that carbohydrates, <coughs> the mainstay of our food, just requires area. There are some experiments to <coughs> grow rice in um, parking lots in, in Japan, for example, but you can imagine the cost is prohibitive. It's not the solution. There is, however, a room for something in the field of horticulture. Combining horticulture, protected environments with urban environments may actually work quite well. We now have greenhouses in Wageningen where we actually produce energy in the greenhouses. We store solar energy in, the, in water or whatever, and actually we can heat a couple of hundred households with one greenhouse. And those are the kinds of ideas that we need to, to exploit and explore as much as possible. Rooftops are uh, the unresourced, unused resource of the cities. But let's be clear, most of the urban land is toxic because it has been used for industry and most of it is too dry because of all kinds of wind effects, so there's not going to be a whole lot. But because in future diets, consuming vegetables and fruits is so as, uh, essential to people and we're so, so low on horticultural products in most areas, horticulture and cities are a good example. And last but not the least, the concentration of people allows us to really go towards a circular economy, to retrieve every single element, proteins, enzymes, from sewage systems, from food waste, and bring them back into the food chain. And again, with the Internet of Things, we can do that much better. So getting a circular food chain city, I think, is a real, real challenge and something we can do. As an example, the Netherlands is the 133rd country in terms of the area of the country. But we are the second largest exporter after the US of food. And why? Because the Netherlands is, in fact, one big interconnected city where we try to make that kind of circular work happening. So I think there is an enormous amount of challenge in circularity, in new proteins, in horticulture, and also particularly to change the perception of people, how food is produced, how it is brought to them, and who will be those fantastic, connected, internet-savvy farmers of the future. Thank you very much.